Hey folks, welcome back to CS 1322. Uh, my name is Enda Sullivan, in case you've forgotten who I am after having watched however many hours of video you've watched of me. Um, so today we are going to begin module number three, which is going to talk a lot about some of the more advanced object-oriented um, stuff. And today in this lecture, we're going to cover the topic of inheritance, which is a fun topic, um, one that you'll get asked about quite a lot in life, as it turns out. Um, there's going to be a second video for this week, which is going to cover the topic of polymorphism, which is the word that makes everybody cringe. So hopefully by the end of that video, you'll be slightly less cringy on polymorphism. Um, so just going to do a little bit of an overview of where we are in the class again. Um, so we have covered modules number one and number two. Uh, this week we begin module number three, and you will see that we're actually going to continue module three for a few weeks here. Um, and that's just because this tends to be a set of information that's not particularly hard. Hopefully after I've explained it, um, this will make sense to you. But it is something that you kind of have to play with a lot for it to start to make sense in your brain, because it's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking about things. Um, we're really going to be talking a lot about encapsulation and putting things into objects and then using them in very specific ways to make sure that the data that's inside of there and the methods that are inside of there are being held in there and they're encapsulated correctly and you're not being able to just willy-nilly make changes outside of the object like you might have. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just as a quick update on the quizzes, hopefully by now you guys have completed quiz number one. If you haven't, it was due August 30th, so depending on when you're watching this video, it's probably in the past. Um, so Hopefully quiz one is done and uh, you did get a second chance on that. I did explain that. A couple of people emailed me and asked, which score do you get if you take it twice? And the answer is the highest score. Um, we did that because there was a couple of people who didn't realize that it was different from the syllabus test and had already just clicked start and then realized, oops, this was a real actual grade. Um, so just as a reminder, what I sent out in the email very quickly, I did say it is the case that you will get to drop your lowest quiz score across all of the quizzes of the semester. Um, there are two tests and a final exam, so a total of three tests that you will take. And if your final exam is a higher grade than either of the other two tests, it will replace one of those two test grades as well. So we give you lots of opportunities if you have a bad week or a bad day or something just goes wrong while you're trying to take something where the lowest quiz score gets dropped and also if you do better on your final, that proves you know the material, so cool, we'll replace one of your lower tests. So that's what's going on there. So again, today we are going to begin module number three. Um, quiz number three will be posted on Monday, which I think is August 31st, and you'll have the usual two weeks. It'll be due on September 13th, and it will cover the material that I'm talking here. The quizzes are obviously, um, you get them after I've covered the material, so that's why they're you have extra time here. All right, so that's the deal with the schedule. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, I continue to have office hours every Tuesday and Thursday. So if you have any questions and you're lost and you just don't understand something, feel free to drop into the office hours. I do them in Collaborate Ultra. So even if you're remote um, or you work, I have one in the morning and I have one in the afternoon. So hopefully if you look at the, uh, the schedule online, you'll be able to figure out which one works better for you. And as I say, I sit in the Collaborate Ultra Classroom that entire time. You can get to it by going into D2L and clicking, I believe it's Other and then Collaborate Ultra um, is up on the top uh, here. And you fire that up and you'll be in the classroom and you can just ask me questions. Just I would ask you to turn on your microphone so that we can talk because it's just easier. You don't have to share your video if you don't want to. That's fine. Um, and I'm happy to go through anything you want. If you happen to be in person, you're also welcome to stop by uh, Norton Hall, room 309, which is where my office is. Um, I'm physically sitting in there while you are, um, while I'm in the Collaborate Ultra session. All right, so that's the end of the logistics. Hopefully you guys are doing well and this material is starting to make sense to you and you're having a little bit of fun. I know you're chugging along in your labs as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on today's material. So as I mentioned today, we're going to talk about um, inheritance. And the topic of inheritance, first off, let's talk about the, the normal word inheritance. So the thing that probably pops into your mind is your parents or somebody else's parents have passed away or an older person, and they give some of their stuff to the next generation. And that's, that's kind of a similar idea as to what's going on in uh, the computer science term uh, inheritance. I guess the difference is that you don't have to wait for somebody to die, which is nice. You can actually just use the stuff that's coming to you. Um, I guess that's true in inheritance in the real world as well, but I'm going to move on quickly to the computer science definitions. All right, so why do we do inheritance at all? Um, the reason is because 
when you have written something in code, you don't want to have to ever rewrite it. And you might say, well, it's not a big deal. I can copy and paste. You can, but the problem with that is then later on, you're going to have to edit every one of those copy pastes that you've made. And that gets really obnoxious. And if you're writing something that's huge, like, you know, take something like Google Docs or Microsoft Office 365, there are millions and millions and millions of lines of code that make up that. You most certainly would not want to have to go through those millions of lines of code and everywhere that you did a spell check, you had written a different version of the spell checker um, across the slides, across the, you know, the Excel or the spreadsheet and across the um, Word doc or um, whatever it's called in Google Docs. Word, I think it's just called text or Word or something. Anyway, whatever. Um, so my point is that once you write a spell checker, it should just be the spell checker. And everybody who needs a spell checker, you should use it. But there may be different versions of the spell checker depending on which language you're in. There may be different rules that have to be written. So inheritance would allow you to have a base class that will be called the spell checker. And then maybe you have an English spell checker and a French spell checker and a Spanish French um, <laughs> spell checker and maybe 500 other different ones that are all inheriting some of the basic properties of the spell checker class. So that's the general idea of inheritance. It saves time, which is a good thing because you don't have to keep rewriting the same code over and over or copying and pasting the same code over and over. It cuts down on mistakes because you're not rewriting the same thing. It makes it easier to maintain because you're not having to maintain four different versions of the same thing. And it also just makes the code more consistent. Um, so in general, it's a good thing. And, and it, it's kind of like the topic that you probably run into in your 1321 or in your 1300 class, where we talked just about abstraction. Instead of writing everything at once, you break it down into smaller bits and you write the bits individually and you test them and you debug them and you make sure that they're rock solid and then you just use them later on. And so you don't have to keep rewriting how to do things over and over again. So let's take an example. Um, the first thing that I'm going to point out on the screen here is this weird box over on the side. And I would have totally said that I had the marker turned on. I did not. All right, this box right here on the side. Um, so this is what's called um, a UML diagram or a universal modeling language diagram. And this is how we would represent a object or a class. In this case, we're calling the class mammal and we're specifying that it has four variables in it which are temperature, weight, IQ, and fur color. We're also saying that it has four methods, which are eat, drink, move, and give birth. So this class, mammal, has four attributes or four variables and four methods. There's a plus and a minus on front of each of these things. So there's a minus here and there's pluses here. In UML world, what that tells us is whether or not they're public or private. If it's a plus, it means that it's public. If it's a minus, it tells us that it's private. So we can actually tell from this diagram that these four variables are actually listed as private variables, and these four methods are listed as public methods. Okay, so that's what the diagram is. Um, the diagrams are helpful for telling us how an object looks and comparing objects to each other and seeing how they inherit from each other, because sometimes that gets complex. You may have an object that inherits from another object that indeed itself inherits from another object that it maybe inherits from another object. There may be a whole chain and it may not be just linear. It may be more like a tree where you have objects that are inheriting from each other down in different branches of the tree. So that all gets very confusing, especially if it's a huge thing that you're writing. So UML just gives you a way to draw it out. Um, a lot of IDEs allow you to just dump your code out to UML so that you can actually see it. There are some automated tools for that. Um, very frequently, you'll see people just drawing this on a board. So that's the, that's the sales pitch for UML. Um, so a mammal is a type of animal, right? And so we know that there are mammals and there are, I don't know, I'm not a biology person. I think there are marsupials and there are rodents and are rodents mammals? Rodents might be mammals. Anyway, don't listen to me about biology things. But a mammal is one class of animal. And we know that there are many different animals that are mammals. So for example, cats are mammals, dogs are mammals. We know that squirrels are mammals, mostly because I looked that up just before recording this video. But we'll pretend that we knew that squirrels were mammals before we started. So the reason that we're doing this definition for a mammal class 
is because later we're going to instantiate that or make, um, we're going to use a lot of the information that we wrote for a mammal when we make a class definition for a dog. Because it turns out some of those things are going to be very similar. Every mammal has a temperature. Um, most mammals are warm-blooded. Again, something I looked up just before this video. Um, most mammals have a weight, which can be anything from a small weight to a large weight. Um, they have an IQ. Um, they have a fur color. Turns out all mammals either have some form of fur or some form of hair. I sense I'm going to get emails after this video where people are going to go, no, actually, that's not true. There are certain mammals that don't have hair. But I think all mammals have hair or fur. Um, Anyway, so maybe we have a fur collar, uh, which is a attribute that will be true for all mammals. Um, so up in the base class, which is what we're calling this, we're defining all of the things that are going to be true across all of our mammals. And then later on, when we define a dog, we may have to change how some of these things work, which is called overriding. Or it may be that we just inherit it from our, our um, base class or our um, super class or our parent, as it were. And we can just use some of that information. So that's the cool part about inheritance. When you inherit from a class, you get to use everything that's available inside of that class. There's some rules around that, which we'll cover in just a moment with regard to access parameters. But overall, you get to use all of the things that are in the class as if you had written them yourself. So if the way that eating works is the same for a dog and a cat and all mammals, then the dog doesn't have to explain how it eats. It just says, I've inherited all of that information from my parent, which is kind of how it works in the real world. Like, I don't think anyone ever sat you down and showed you how to eat. I mean, they probably gave you table manners at some level about not just shoving it all in your face at once as I drop my pen. But um, you basically knew how to eat because you inherited that information from your parent. Um, so this is our mammal class. If we were now going to go on and create our dog class, what we could do is we could just copy all of the code from the mammal class and paste it into the dog class. And that would work. It would be messy. Because again, if you have to change something about how that works in all mammals, you're going to have to go in and rewrite the code in every single one of those classes. Which, if you've ever actually had to do that, you will realize how painful that is. Because every now and again, we get lazy and we say, oh, I'm not just going to figure out how to abstract that. I'm just going to copy and paste it. It's, it's very basic. It's pretty much the same thing. And then you think, oh, actually, I need to copy and paste it again because I'm going to do it a third time. And then it's a fourth time. And then it's a ninth time. And then you're looking at it and you're like, OK, well, that wasn't the best decision, but life is good. And then one morning you come into work and something has changed and you have to go back and change it in all nine of those places. And that's when you go, yep. I really should have been a better person and I should have abstracted that out um, and made it into separate uh, things that I'm inheriting or at least abstracted it out in one way or another. So do not just copy and paste. You're going to do it anyway, but don't do that. That's not the right answer. The right answer is to figure out how to abstract it and how to write it correctly for the base class and then inherit for all of the subclasses if you're in an object-oriented environment like we are here. Okay, so if we were drawing out what we're going to do here, we have dogs, cats, and cows, apparently. Hope cows are mammals. Yeah, sure they are. They have fur. Totally mammals. <laughs> okay, so dogs, cats, and cows all inherit from mammal in this diagram. And that's what's going on here with these arrows that are drawn. So the arrows are telling us that each of these is inheriting from what's above. Um, there's actually a word for this. Um, which I'm going to cover in just a second. First off, we're going to talk about what that means when you inherit all of this stuff. So right now, if we have just created a dog and said that it is inheriting everything from a mammal, but we've done nothing else inside of the class, the question is, how many attributes and how many methods does it have? So I've written no methods. I've written no attributes inside of my dog class. But I did say that the dog inherits from mammal. The question is, well, how many attributes and how many methods does it have? And the answer is four, because the dog inherited these four and these four. It immediately knows how to eat, how to drink, how to move, and how to give birth. Very specifically, it knows what the mammal knows how to do. And we hope that that's how it's supposed to be for a dog or a cat or a cow, and that all of those are pretty much the same, which I don't think they are, because I think cows mostly eat grass, and I think dogs given a choice, would prefer a meat. Um, I think cats are mostly meats as well. I mean, I think that dogs will eat grass, but only when they're feeling bad, I think. 
Yeah, not a biology person. You should not be listening to me about these types of things. But the point of this is that the way that you eat, if you don't specify anything else, you just inherit how you eat as a mammal. And in general, the answer to that is probably pretty close to right. Most mammals just, you know, use their mouth, grab whatever the food is, put it in, chew, and eventually swallow. There's some amount of saliva in your mouth that's breaking down the food, the chewing breaks it down into smaller bits, and then your intestines go through dealing with all of the breaking down into other chemicals and whatnot. So the basic idea of how you eat is probably actually very similar from all three of these, but there are differences, and those differences are things we would want to call out. But it's better to start off from the point of we inherit most of the things that are correct and then we update whatever. So the trick question was how many attributes does a dog have right now and how many methods? And the answer is they have four each because of inheritance. Okay, so once you've now instantiated your dog and it has all of the, or sorry, not instantiated, you've created the class for your dog that you've inherited from mammal, the moment you do that, you now have the ability to start adding specific things to a dog that may not be there for all mammals. So an example of that is, as I said, that your uh, dogs may have a different way of moving from some other animal, uh, some other mammal. Um, you may have a two-legged mammal and a four-legged mammal. Don't send me email if there's no such thing as a two-legged mammal. Just go with it and pretend that there's two-legged mammals. I think squirrels are two-legged. Going with that. Humans are two-legged. I think we're human mammals. All right, so the way that a squirrel walks and the way that a dog walks are going to be slightly different. So in both of those cases, we are going to have to write something different because the move, which is up here that's generically divine, or defined for a mammal, is going to be different for these guys. All right, since I have dropped my pen, I'm going to pause and go grab my pen. So I apologize for the interruption. And this is just not letting me pause today. That's going to be a problem in general. Okay, and we're back, and I have a pen again. All right, I'll try not to throw it on the floor again. So customizing your dog is going through and adding attributes and methods that are specific to your dog. And in some cases, you may have to override what was there for a mammal. All right, so let me first take the word override and explain that there are two words that are very similar sounding, but they're actually quite different meanings. So we have override, which is what we're talking about here, where we are going through and we are changing or redefining a method that we have inherited. So again, our move method may only speak of how a two-legged animal moves, and as a dog, I will have to change what it means to move. So I would override the definition of move from my parent. An overload is something that we talked about in a previous class, and that's where you have the same method. It is a method with the same name, but it has different parameters. That's an overload. And the example there was you might have a constructor in an object that takes in no parameters, and you may have another constructor for the same object that takes in a parameter or two parameters because you want to set something when you very specifically create it. So they're both examples where you're going to have two methods with the same name, but they are different. One is changing what you have inherited which is called an override, and the other one is giving two different definitions for the same method depending on the parameters that are coming in. So hopefully that makes sense. The words actually make sense in English, like override really does mean override, and overload means you're adding an additional way to do something, which maybe helps. All right, we are going to use the phrase is a a lot when you're talking about inheritance, because a dog is a mammal. A cow is also a mammal, despite what that says on my screen. There is a new version of these slides that's posted on the FYE site that does not say that. Um, when I first saw this, I did think about that for a moment. Is there any circumstance where a cow could be a vehicle? And yes, I guess you could ride a cow. I guess that would be probably not working out very well for you. But anyway, so what this is supposed to say is that a cow is a mammal, um, not a cow is a vehicle. Um, so the key point here is, is a is a is the phrase that you're going to say a lot when you're dealing with inheritance. A subclass of a parent is always going to say the subclass is a parent. A dog is a mammal. A car is a vehicle is what that might have said. Um, and so on and so forth. So it is a way of describing what you are based on your parent. You are 
that type. You is a vehicle or is a mammal. All right. I've used these words before on this next line uh, with regard to the name of the parent. So I've sometimes called it a parent. I've sometimes called it a base class. And I don't think I've ever used the word super, but that is an equivalent term. All three of these mean the same thing. In our picture that we just looked at, the UML, mammal is a base class. And the word base class comes into effect when you're dealing in C sharp. That's what it's called there or a superclass, which is what it's called in Java, or generically across pretty much every language, it's also called a parent. And again, that's because in English, that's what that means. Uh, you're inheriting stuff from your parent makes sense in English. You're inheriting stuff from your base or from your super, maybe not quite as clear. But all three of those words are equivalent, and you're going to see them used interchangeably, and I'm going to use them interchangeably. Um, parent, base, super, all mean the same thing. The derived class, which is the name of the child, uh, you've got a couple of names down here as well. Sometimes it's going to be called a derived class, sometimes it's going to be called a subclass, and sometimes, probably more often, it's going to be called a child. So obviously a child relates to a parent. Um, sub and derived are just the words that people tend to use when talking about children of a parent. All right, so hopefully those words make sense and you'll remember them as we go along. So let's stop yapping at a high level and let's actually look at some code. So we're first going to take a look at some C sharp. So up at the top here, we have class mammal. And class mammal only has two attributes. They are both public attributes, a weight and an IQ. Um, and then we have a class dog, which is inheriting from mammal. And the specific way that you say that it's inheriting is this colon that's right here. So class dog inherits from mammal. Mammal has to be defined as a class that it can see. So if there is no mammal, you're going to get a compiler error at that point because you can't inherit from something that doesn't exist. Mostly. I will explain that mostly in just a moment. Um, so now down at the bottom, I can instantiate a dog just like I always could have. There's nothing magical about the dog from the standpoint of how I use it, it's still used the same way. I would have a variable of type dog, which I'm calling D, and I would call the constructor on dog by saying new dog. And obviously I would have to have added a constructor in here if I wanted to do something. If I don't add the constructor, it will do what a blank constructor always does, which is pretty much nothing. It'll set some variables to zero for you. Um, so a dog, in this case, inherited from a mammal. That's the real important part here. The syntax is this, a colon, and that's if you're in C sharp. If I flip over to Java, you're going to see that all of this code is exactly the same, with the exception of the colon. It has now magically changed the word extends. So dog extends mammal is how you say it in Java. Dog colon mammal is how you say it in C sharp. That's it. That's how you write inherited um, classes. There are a couple of other minor differences here because of string being lowercase versus uppercase and also main being lowercase versus uppercase, but those are things that you would normally have and obviously what you're importing is different. But the key point that is different is this extends versus this colon. Okay, so we're gonna talk at a very high level here for just a moment. Could you ever make a class of type mammal? Yes, we just did that. Would you ever make an object of type mammal? Meaning, would you ever instantiate a mammal? And the question would be, what exactly would that be? I would be instantiating a generic animal. Very specifically, a generic mammal. Mm. It has fur or hair. We know that. Um, it has a body temperature and it has a weight and an IQ and we know it needs to eat and drink and sleep and maybe um, have baby. But there is no actual thing as a generic mammal that's running around. I will grant you on walks occasionally I see creatures and I think I don't know what that is and I don't want to know what that is. But it is not a generic mammal. It is actually some mammal and I just don't know what it is. Um, so you probably would never actually instantiate mammal in this example. This is a case where you're making something that's abstract so that later you can use that to make more specific things like dogs and cats. 
<coughs> and indeed, there's a keyword that we're going to talk about later where you can declare that this isn't actually something you'd ever instantiate. This is just an abstract general idea. And we're going to talk about the abstract keyword in a future class. I think it's actually next week. Um, but I wanted you to think through that for just a moment. And, and this example is one example. A people might be the base class. And you may have students, and you may have um, customers, and you may have all kinds of other types of people. You'd never really instantiate people because that's not really what you would do. You would instantiate customer, or you would instantiate student, or you'd instantiate teacher, which are more useful classes, more usable. So that's the concept, but just wanted to stick it in your brain there for later so that when we come back to it at some point, you'll be, um, you'll be familiar with the concept. All right, so the next topic that we're going to very briefly talk on is the beginnings of the thinking about polymorphism. So up here we are talking about when you instantiate something, when you actually go to make an object of these classes, what can you make the object of? Like, what can you specifically say new to? So in our example two slides ago, down here we said dog D gets new dog. And that makes sense. Dog is the class name. D is the name of my variable. And I'm saying, please call the constructor on new dog and actually make me a instantiated object called dog. Great. So is a dog a dog? Well, yes. I mean, what I mean by that is in this example, D is a dog and I'm calling the new constructor on dog. And that's absolutely true. The next question is, is a cat a cat? So if I had an equivalent set of code where I'm instantiating a cat, then the answer is yes, of course a cat is a cat. But now let me ask these last two questions. Is a dog a mammal? Well, yes. I have very specifically said that the dog extends mammal. So we're not gonna talk about it right now, but I could declare a dog as a new mammal, or I could have a mammal where I make a new dog maybe. And those are the very beginnings of polymorphism that I want you to think about. Because once you have a dog defined as extending mammal, and you have a cat defined as extending mammal, and apparently you have a cow that's extending mammal, then you can now start making classes, or sorry, you can start making objects of each of those types. And polymorphism is the idea that even while the code is running, you can actually change the type. And so here's an example up here. Um, we have a dog D and a cat C, and we say mammal, which is our base class M, gets new dog. And that's something we haven't really seen before, where I'm now able to instantiate a, use the dog definition to create a mammal. Um, and likewise, I can then immediately come along and change it to new cat, assuming that cat is also inheriting from mammal. That's a bucket of crazy. We're going to think about that more, but I wanted to get that into your brain so that you can start allowing that to, let's call it ferment in your brain. Um, we'll come back to that later. Polymorphism is something that people really, really love to talk about in job interviews because it's one of those things that either you understand it or you don't understand it. And that tells people in interviews, arguably, whether or not you're going to be a good developer. Personally, I don't know if that's really the differentiator, but you will find in a lot of companies, they will ask you, what is polymorphism and why would you use it? So we're going to come back to that. There's going to be a whole section on that. Um, so don't fret too much, but wanted to get it into your head as a thought. All right. So let's do a little bit of detail here. The first thing is that every class that you have defined up until now actually has been inheriting from object. And you say, well, I never did that. I never, well, what are you talking about? I have never used the word extends and I have never put a colon after the name of my class that I'm writing. I most certainly did not inherit from object. Well, you did. It turns out that in both C Sharp and in Java, object is the mother of all classes. And what I mean by that is literally every class that you create will by default inherit from object. So this may explain something that we have said in the past and something that you have run into. So we've talked about the method toString, which is used when you try to pass an object into something like a console.writeLine or a system.out.println. What does it mean to print a dog? Well, mm, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense, right? 
but we want it to make sense. We might want it so that when you print a dog, it prints out, hello, my name is Fluffy, or hello, my name is a cow's name if it's a cow, which I'll leave that to you to decide on. Um, so what does object do? The object called object, what does it do if you don't override string? Well, it turns out that they actually have methods called toString that is defined in object. And if you're in Java, what it does is it prints out the memory address of the object that you printed, which is not particularly useful for anybody, but hey, they had to do something. So they said, hey, we'll tell you what the memory address is. Why not? In C Sharp, it just prints the name of the class, which is probably a little bit more useful um, so that you're at least getting something that's human readable. Um, so we have mentioned before that you will typically override to string when you create an object. Why? Well, you're actually overriding what was originally defined in object. It's always been there and you've always been inheriting it. That's why you have to override it, not just define to string. There is a to string that is there when you start it. The moment that you created your class, it inherently, it inherited from object and you inherited a method called toString, which does something dumb, either printing a memory address or printing the name of the class. You probably wanted to do something more useful, so you've been told you will need to override toString, and you will need your own definition of what it is that you wanted to do for your object. So in order to override it, you're going to have to write something with the same signature as is in the original code. So I'm going to show you this and just point out that you actually can be explicit about this. Here is our class mammal. And this is exactly what was on the previous slide. We just said class mammal, we opened some curly braces and we defined a couple of variables. Cool. This code down here is actually identical. Class mammal extends object. It actually is inherently happening. That is there up here as well. It's just invisible code. The equivalent, obviously, in C Sharp would be there's implicitly a colon object down here. So I want you to know that sometimes things are happening automatically for you because you would have a need for some very basic things that an object should be able to do. And the way that that works is you're always inheriting from object. And the basic things that you might need to be able to do are defined in object. And the moment that you write a new class and it inherits from object, you get access to those methods. So let's take a look at overwriting to string. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but I, I want to go through it again. So here's our class mammal again at the very top. And um, it is, in this case, very explicitly overwriting object. We're writing here in C sharp. And we're defining, ah, moving slides. We're defining a couple of attributes and we're setting up some stuff in our constructor. So we have a method called mammal, which matches the name of my class, and it is setting the weight to seven and the IQ to 45. Maybe not the brightest bulbs. All right, now we've got a dog, which is inheriting from mammal because of this colon. And in here, I'm going to override what it means to use to string. So I'm actually overwriting it in mammal which mammal may also have overridden it in object because there may be a need to call to string in mammal. Turns out we don't have code for it, so we're presuming that mammal has no need to ever be called in a print method. So we're just going to overwrite it in dog. So in C sharp, I use the keyword override, which you may or may not have ever seen before. That is required. The reason it's required is because if I didn't put in the keyword override, there would be the question to the compiler, wait a minute, I've already seen a method to string. It's right here in object. And he's down here trying to redefine to string. What the heck is he doing? So in C sharp, it requires that you specify, I am overriding to string. So you say public override string because it returns a string to string. And then in this case, I'm producing a new local string called S which has weight is weight and IQ is IQ, and I'm returning that. And the syntax of that hopefully makes sense from the standpoint of manipulating a string. You can simply add bits onto a string, and you can also use the plus equal operator in case you've never seen that before. The plus equal operator takes whatever is in S 
and adds to it whatever you put after the equal. It's the same as writing s equals s plus some ad additional string. So the two string override here is printing out something more useful about my dog. It tells me his weight and his IQ, his or her weight and IQ. Um, and then down at the bottom, we're doing the same thing that we were doing before. We're saying dog D is a new dog. And then we're specifying console.writeLine D, which is our dog. And as you can see, that's going to print out weight is seven and IQ is 45 because we have overridden dog. If we did not have this block of code that talks about how to override to string, at the moment that we did that console.writeLine, what we would have gotten is the word dog, which is the name of the class, because that's what the default of object says to do. All right, looking at that same code in Java, um, pretty much nothing changes. There's just a couple of things to, to mention here. We have the word extends. Mammal implicit, ah, gosh. Mammal explicitly extends object here because we decided to. It'll work either way, whether we did or not. Dog extends mammal. That's the difference there. And then there's a weirdness that's written here in green. In Java, the override, which is written as an at sign override, is technically optional. I would strongly encourage you anytime you're doing an override to put the at override on front of it. Uh, the reason that it's optional is because Java just allows you to do it without actually specifying that you're doing it. If it sees something that is an override, it assumes it's an override and it assumes you knew what you were talking about. The reason that you want to put it in there is because it allows the compiler to check that you actually did the right thing. If you're overriding to string, there should be no parameter. If you were to write a to string and take in an integer for some reason or something along those lines, then you're not actually overriding to string because there is no to string method in object that takes an integer. In that case, you would be overloading to string. So by putting the word override on front of it, you're telling Java, my intention here is to override. Please double check me and make sure I'm not being an idiot. And so I would encourage you to always use the word override. All right, other than that, this code works the same as it did in C Sharp. So hopefully that's nice and clear. All right, so let's talk about this base object. Um, what methods do we get with this base object? So there's a couple of them that we're already familiar with, and I apologize. I don't think these slides look this way when you pull them down yourself, but um, I apologize that it's blue text on a blue background. Down here, it says to string, and that is the method that we have been talking about, which returns um, a string representation of the current object. So that one we have already talked about. That is defined in the object class. The other things that are in here are the ability to do equals, um, which can either take one object or two objects so that you can say object dot equals and pass it another object, or you can just say equals and then pass it two objects and it will tell you whether they're equal. And the definition of whether they're equal means that they are at least of the same data type um, and so on. There is also the object or the method called finalize, which is to the last, it gives the object an opportunity to clean up before it gets cleaned up by the garbage collector. So there may be things that you would want to do right before your object is cleaned up. Um, very specifically, you might want to close out some files or disconnect from a remote server in a nice clean way, as opposed to a <laughs> way, which is what the garbage collector is going to do. Um, get, get hash code is a very specific thing. It gives you a hash about the object. And a hash is basically a small numeric representation of the object, which can be used to compare different objects. And it has some very specific stuff. You're welcome to go Google that one if you care. It's not really the point of this lecture. Um, get type tells you the current type of an object. Memberwise clone gives you a clone of the object. And reference equals tells you whether two references are actually the same instance. So that's the C sharp ones. The Java ones have pretty much all of the same things as there, but it also has a couple of things that deal with waking up threads, which is going to come into effect when we're talking about a multi-threaded application or an application that's running concurrently on multiple different processors or multiple cores, or at least as multiple threads. So we're going to deal with all of that in about, mm, I don't know, five weeks, I think, when we deal with um, concurrency. So the weights, and the notifies, those are all that. The other methods are pretty much the same as what you saw in C-sharp. There's a two string, there's a clone, there's an equals, and so on and so forth. So these are the methods that are exposed by the root object um, in both C-sharp and in Java. Okay, 
The next thing to mention here is that C Sharp and Java do not allow you to inherit from two different parents. You can only inherit from one parent. Um, C++, if you've ever dealt in that world, does allow you to do that. And that's a very specific thing to C++. So the good news here is for you guys, you don't ever have to worry about that. You're only inheriting from one parent. And the syntax is what I just showed you with a colon or the extends keyword. All right. So how do you talk about a parent's methods if you are for some reason trying to call something inside of your own object or something in your parent's object? If you have something where you have the same name, that could actually get very confusing. So we're going to take a look at a couple of examples here. So we're going to start off with a class phone. And the phone has a manufacturer, which is a string. And it has a version number, which is going to be stored as a float version 1.3, whatever. All right, we have a constructor here, which takes in a manufacturer. And it takes in a version. I need to stop doing that. And it sets manufacturer to manufacturer and version to version. Mm. Even if you're not a compiler, that's pretty darn confusing. So what it's saying is take this variable, which is a local parameter in this method, that's this one, and assign it to this one, which is the variable that is part of the class. But that's very confusing especially when you say manufacturer equals manufacturer. So to differentiate the local manufacturer, which is the one that's local to this method, and the one that is part of the object, you use the keyword this. This refers to this class that we are talking about here. Not this method, the class, the bigger object that we are inside of. So that's why we're saying this.manufacturer equals manufacturer, this.version equals version, this dot initialize. Initialize may be some method that we have down here in our um, in our class that does something to initialize the phone. I don't know. It sets up the IMEI number or whatever it is you do with phones. I know as much about phones as I do mammals. OK, I probably know more about phones. Um, we also have another constructor here, which is one that takes in no parameters. And it goes ahead and sets the manufacturer to Nokia and the version to 1.337F. Now, the way that that's written may be new to you. I'm simply saying this and passing it to parameters. So what am I doing here? Let's talk again where we are. We're in a constructor for phone that took in no parameters. And what I'm simply calling is this, which is this class, and I'm passing it to arguments. Nokia and a number that's a float. So what that's going to do is it's going to call the other constructor because the other constructor is part of the class and it has two parameters. And since these match, it'll call the other one. So this is a really handy way of writing a default um, constructor, which you can call the more specific one and pass it the information without having to rewrite all that code again. Again, if you're rewriting the same code in multiple methods, you're doing it wrong. Stop doing that. Um, all right, so hopefully that explains the word this. It is when you are referring to this particular object, this particular class. All right, so what happens if I don't want to talk about this object? I want to talk about my parent's method. So I'm a dog, and I inherited move from my mammal, which is my parent. I want to just call move. Well, I may need to specify if I have my own move method, I may want to specify that I want to call my parents move method for some reason. It may be that my move method is very specific and the generic one that's up in the parent may be sufficient in some cases. So because I have a move and I've overridden the definition of move, if you want to call the parents, you're going to need to specify that I mean the parents move, not the local dogs move. So there are two keywords, one for each of the languages. In Java, the keyword is super. In C Sharp, the keyword is base. Um, those are both the ways that you refer to the parent. And I mentioned this 10 slides ago when I said, you sometimes call the parent the super, and you sometimes call the parent the base uh, in because of the languages. These are literally the keywords. So if I wanted to call, if I'm in the child, I'm in the dog, and I want to call 
move, I would say super.move, parentheses, because I'm calling a method, or I would say base.move, parentheses, because I'm calling a method. And that will specifically call the move routine that is in my parent. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's take a look at this again. Um, and here's another block of code. So we're going to go ahead and write up our class for mammal, and we're going to allow our mammal to make noise. So public void make noise, and it's going to print out, ow. Yep, you saw it here first. All right, so system.out.println, so obviously we're in Java here. Dog extends mammal. Okay, so we're saying the dog is going to take everything that mammal knows, and it's going to be a child of mammal. And then the very first thing that I'm doing in dog is I'm overriding make noise because it turns out a dog does not say, oh, I mean, it might, but it probably doesn't. Dog probably says woof. Even I know this. So you may want it so that you first wanted to hear what the parent would have said, and then you wanted to hear what the dog would have said. And I know this is a weird example, but if you wanted to do that, super dot make noise is your way of saying, I want you to call this guy. I want you to call the make noise, make noise from the parent. And then I want you to print out wolf. So the output of this would be Ow, wolf after you call dog make noise because it specifically is calling its parent. Here's the equivalent code for that in C sharp. And again, little to nothing has changed other than that colon right there and the fact that the override is inside of the definition and the header as opposed to being at override written above it. Again, most everything is the same and you'll still get Ow. Okay, there is one more key point that I have to mention in C sharp. This is specific to the C sharp folks. In order to be able to override a method in a base class, you have to specify that the method is virtual. If you do not put that word virtual in there, you will not be able to override that method. When you try to override it down here, you will get an error. So if it is to be allowed to be overridden, you mark it as virtual. That's really all that that word means. So something to be aware of. When you're defining the base class, there may be times you want the children to override, and there may be some things that you're like, no, I'm sorry, all mammals must do this. This is a rule of mammals and you will never overwrite it. We will all be doing this. Make noise, yeah, that one probably needs to be overwritable because, well, dogs bark and cats meow. Um, and cows moo, pretty sure. Um, so there you go. So make sure you put in the word virtual if you want them to be allowed to overwrite. There is no equivalent word in Java. If we go back to the Java example here, you can see there's nothing in that definition of make noise that says that it can be overridden. All right. So when you see super and base directly called, it's going to call the parent's constructor. I'm going to say that again, because that's a weird thing that you wouldn't necessarily think. The moment that I call something in the parent, the constructor is going to get called. And if you think about this for just a moment, it makes sense. If I am a dog and I'm about to call make noise on a mammal, well, I better have initialized the mammal first. If I didn't do anything to initialize the mammal, then the very first thing that has to happen is the constructor needs to be called. This happens as invisible code. It's not written in there. So let's take a look at an example. And again, we're going to start off in C sharp. So class mammal has a public constructor called console.writeLine, and it outputs mammal constructor. Class dog extends mammal, and it has a constructor that says dog constructor. All right, so this is a stupid example. Why are we doing this? There's no good reason. We're just specifying that the constructors are being called so that we can actually see it happen. So the constructor for dog and the constructor for mammal will print out something when they are called. So here I am in my main method and I say dog D equals new dog. All right, what I would have expected in my head is that at the moment that I instantiate the dog, the constructor for dog would have fired. So I would have expected dog constructor to get printed on my screen. It will, but before I see dog constructor, the moment that I did this because it inherits from mammal, 
it'll actually fire the constructor in mammal first. And what I will actually get on my screen is mammal constructor, dog constructor. I will see both constructors firing. This is a little bit confusing, but it does really make sense. Again, if you think about it for just a few moments, you would have to instantiate the um, parent in order to get access to all of its public methods and all of its things, and it would have to be in a sane state. The way that you get into a sane state is by firing the constructor. Please note, nowhere in this code does it say base.mammal or anything like that to say, please call the constructor in mammal. There is no code in here telling it to call the constructor for mammal. It just automatically happens. It is another example of silent or hidden code effectively. All right, we're going to look at the exact same code here. And what we're going to do is this is still C sharp. I'm going to very specifically call the constructor myself in case I wanted to. The syntax for calling a constructor is a little bit different than calling any other method. Just because it's a constructor, it is very specific. And that's what's lit written here in this yellow outlined area. So inside of my um, dog uh, class definition where I'm extending mammal, I am saying dog, which is my constructor name, colon base. And this is forcefully telling it to call the constructors, um, the constructor for my parent. I am then going in and actually doing whatever it is that I want to do inside of my constructor. So this is an explicit way of doing it, just like colon object at the top was an explicit way of saying I'm inheriting from object. Yes, you are. It's inherently happening, whether you like it or not. Down here, this is getting called either way. I am so sorry. This is getting called either way, whether I specify that or not. But by saying it explicitly, you can see what's happening. And I just wanted to show you what the syntax is because you may want to call a different constructor than the base constructor, i.e. you may want to pass parameters in there because it may be that when you're instantiating a dog, you always want to call a specific constructor that sets some attributes of the parent that you're inheriting from because dogs may have specific requirements. So that's how you call it manually. If you don't put this in here, it will call it automatically and it will call the default constructor, the constructor that has no parameters, which in this case isn't even coded up here. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, it is coded, uh, sorry. Um, it's mammal constructor, it is that guy. Okay, and now we're looking at Java and this is going to be the same thing that we just talked about over in the C Sharp. Um, everything is the same again. The difference here is we're doing extends mammal and the thing is this does exactly the same thing. It will call the constructor for mammal and then call the constructor for dog when I say new dog. And if I wanted to make that more explicit, the syntax here is pretty much the same. Up on top, it was extends object instead of the colon object, which we had. And the piece that's in yellow in C sharp was that, I'm so sorry, after the dog, there was a colon and then base and then uh, parentheses. In Java, we mentioned that the way that you specify that you want to talk about the parent is use the keyword super. And if you simply say super and pass it a pair of parentheses, you're asking it to call the constructor for the parent. So that's the explicit syntax for calling the parent's constructor. Whether that highlighted object extends object and super, whether the parts that are highlighted in yellow on that screen are there or not, this code will do exactly the same thing. The constructors get called either way. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the differences between public and private and how they relate to our inheritance. So before now, we talked about public and we said that if you declare a method or a variable as being public, then what you're saying is that anybody can call that method or anybody can look at that uh, variable. If you said that it's private, then what you were saying is no one can look at it except for methods inside of the object. When we have a variable in an object, you probably want it to be private if you possibly can. You shouldn't be exposing huge amounts of stuff publicly, especially the internal structure of how something works. And I'm going to give you a really weird example. Bear with me here for just a moment. So we have our mouth. And the mammal says that we have fur. So let's fur or hair. 
So let's talk about how we would store the details of that fur or hair inside of our mammal. And yes, I know this is weird, but you would have to store every single hair or every single piece of fur. Because for some dogs, they can have multiple different colors. It's not uncommon for a cat to have a white face, but then a black body or vice versa, or to have white paws or whatever. Um, so in order to make all of that data, you'd have to have this really large, probably array that held every single hair in each cell. And maybe the array would have attributes like the thickness of the hair and the color of the hair in order to um, actually store all of that information about this object. And again, I know weird example. But what should that be? Should that be public or private? And that gets even more complex when we talk about the relationship between a dog and its parent, a mammal. But let's ignore the inheritance for just a moment. Let's just talk about a dog. So presuming that I want to store all of the information about the dog's hair, where should I be storing that? Well, the answer is probably that it should be stored privately because you wouldn't want someone to be able to go in and manipulate the color of the hair from outside of the dog. If you want them to be able to manipulate the color of the hair, you should give them a setter or, you know, getters and setters. Because that way you can guarantee that they don't do something too, too crazy. So an example of our setter in the case of hair color might be that you may allow them to dye the dog. It's St. Patrick's Day. Let's have a green dog. Let's dye him. Please don't do that. Um, but anyway, if you do that, then you're calling a setter and the setter validates that what you're doing makes sense. It would have to make sure that every individual hair got dyed if that's what you're doing. Um, so a setter would be a better way to do it because you can make sure that they're not doing something too, too crazy. Like you could deny them the ability to dye the hair green. That's not a valid color. We're not doing that. As a matter of fact, your setter for hair color may indeed simply return stop. <laughs> don't do it, and then just return. Um, you know, prints out, rah, 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 don't do that. Um, but let's talk about the length of the hair. So you have to keep track of that as the dog ages, the hair is going to grow. At some point, if it's a shedding dog, the hair is going to fall out. If it's a non-shedding dog, then it just keeps growing and growing and growing. So you're going to have to expose a few methods for dealing with that, because eventually the dog is going to go to the groomer and get a haircut. Um, or the dog is going to have the hair brushed, which is going to have the effect of pulling out some of the hairs, or spring comes along and a whole pile of the undercoat has to go away and it's just going to shed. So those are methods that you would have for manipulating the private data, which is the storage and the details of all of the hair or the fur. All right, so hopefully that makes sense in the, in the, when we're talking about the dog. Now let's talk about how you would deal with that if it is coming from the parent. So the parent in this case is a mammal. And as we said, all mammals have either fur or hair. It's a rule that I have made up today. Um, so if that's true, then the data structure for storing that should be in the parent. There's no reason for the dog to be defining this huge array of hairs because all mammals have it. So you should be moving that up into the mammal class. And all the methods that you would need for cutting and shedding and um, growing, those methods should be up in the parent. But should they be public or should they be private? Or are there circumstances where you may want to be able to overwrite it? So let's talk through it. The structure that we're storing, the array of hairs, should probably be private for the same reason that I said in the dog. Nobody should be directly changing the hair of the mammal. Um, the mammal is going to protest. The methods that you're giving them for setting would probably be public. If a inherited child does not want that method to be available, then it would simply overload it. Uh, I said the wrong word. It will simply overwrite it and return nothing. So the example there is you may have a, a mammal which doesn't shed its winter coat. It always has a winter coat. I don't know, polar bears jump to mind. They probably don't shed their winter coat because, well, it's always winter where they live. So the method for shed in spring may be overridden in a polar bear and simply does nothing. Um, so that's an example of, it's a public method that's in the parent. The children may choose to override it. So, 
We've talked about public and private. What we haven't talked about is a third class, which is our third um, delimiter, which is called protected. What protected means is that not only can methods inside of the parent, where it is declared protected, access that information, but also anybody in, who inherits from that parent would also have permission to access that information, but only their children, only children of the object would be able to do it. So to be clear, if mammal had a protected variable, which we will call, I don't know, uh, weight for some reason, then any of the children of mammal, so our dogs, our cats, our squirrels and our polar bears, they would all be able to directly access it as if it is a public variable. But any other class or any other block of code that isn't inheriting would not be able to access it. So that's why it's called protected. It's protected within the chain of inheritance. Um, so there we go. We have a handy chart. All right, private and protected members. Private and members of a derived class cannot directly access private members of the base class. Okay. If you are a child, in this case, dog of mammal, you cannot change mammal's private things. So if there's something that mammal needs you to be able to change or needs to allow its children to change, it has to mark them as protected, not private. If there's something private in mammal, Hopefully, MAML also ex um, uh, makes public a bunch of setters for that property. And the child can absolutely call the setters, assuming that the setters are public. But the child cannot call any method that is private. And this is to protect that a dog doesn't magically just change some definition of all mammals, because that doesn't make sense. The dog shouldn't be changing its own stuff, but it shouldn't be just reaching into the parent. If there's a need for the child to be able to reach into the parent and change the definition for everybody, then the parent needs to mark it as protected. Um, all right. So let's take a look at the four access modifiers that exist. We've already talked about public and private. I just mentioned protected. The fourth one is default which is what happens if you don't specify public, private, or protected? As a matter of fact, if I were to jump back five or six slides here, you'll notice that for some of these things, eh, that's not true, they were all marked as public or private, but you can absolutely create something and not specify whether it's public or private. So the question is what happens in that circumstance? So who can access the information? If it is public, then anybody within the same class can access it. That makes sense. Um, Anybody who is in a subclass of it can access it. As a matter of fact, if it's public, the answer to all of these questions is yes, everybody can access it. If it's private on the other extreme, then the answer is nobody other than people within that class can access it. And I think those probably make good sense. If it's protected, then the answer is the same class can do it, the subclasses can do it, another class of the same package, if you're dealing in Java packages, can do it, the subclasses of the other classes in the package can do it, but um, packages in another class, in another package are not, sorry, classes in another package and their subchildren are not allowed to. So that's the definition of protected. The default does vary slightly by language, but in general, the default is that anything that you, spe that you don't specify as having an access modifier is accessible in the same class and it's accessible in the children it is very similar to protected. All right. Okay, so the next thing to mention here is that private members cannot be inherited. They have to be accessed through the getters and setters. And I've said this before, but I'm just going to say it again because you will probably try to do it. If the parent has a method or the parent has a variable that is marked as private, just because you inherited from that parent does not mean that you have access to it. You cannot change it. You cannot talk to it in any way or see it. The only way that you can access it is through getters and setters, just like you are somebody outside of the class. All right. What is the right answer is the next question here. What should you be doing? And the answer is 
as much as possible, you should be setting your variables to private. If you don't know, the right answer is make it private and set, set up some getters and setters. Give them public methods to manipulate that private data. That's what you should always do. If in doubt, make the data structure private, make any method that can be private private, and set up public manipulators to allow you to go in and get or set those, those variables. Why is this best practice? Because you're hiding some of the internals that are your, your problem inside of your class from anybody who is using it. Again, to give an example, we instantiate a dog called Fido. I should not be able to go in and rearrange the hairs on that dog. Even though it's an array, and I know how to change things in an array, I shouldn't be able to do that. Don't allow me to do that. If I want to be able to manipulate the hair, then give me a set of parameters and rules that I have to follow, or don't let me do it at all. So that's the idea of the getters and setters. You're abstracting away the internals of the structure from the people who are using the object. And very specifically, when you do that, you need to implement appropriate rules. Yes, you can right click in your IDE and have it generate all the getters and setters for you, and they are there, but they're not doing anything. That's pretty much the same as setting it to a public because, well, they're just taking whatever and passing it in. You need to think through what are reasonable sets of rules for accessing this data and who would I want to allow to do that? All right. The second statement on this slide is that constructors are not inherited. And that makes sense because again, the constructor for a mammal and the constructor for a dog are almost certainly going to be different. And if we take it out to another example for people, which you could inherit students from people, or sorry, student is a people, or student is a person, and teacher is a person, and employee is a person, and employer is a person, then person is the base class. The constructor for a person would be different than the constructor for a student. A student has a student ID, the person does not. So inheriting the constructor hmm, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Having said that, we did see in the previous example that it is possible and actually quite common in the child to call the constructor of the parent because often the things that are true in the parent you also want to be true in the, in the um, child, but you may have specific things that you want to overwrite. So it's not uncommon to call the parent's constructor, but you're not inheriting it in a way that you can um, inherit other methods. Either implicitly or explicitly, a call to a base class constructor is always going to be made. I've covered that, I've said it many times. When you instantiate the child, the parent's constructor is going to get called. The class object has a default empty constructor that actually does nothing. So in actuality, these, these constructors are fired all the way up the chain. When you instantiate dog, it's going to instantiate, it's going to call the constructor for dog, which in turn is going to call the constructor for mammal, which in turn is going to call the constructor for object. Again, the constructor for object does actually nothing, but it is getting called. So just keep that in mind. Even if the class doesn't have a constructor specifically written, it is going to call the parameterless constructor, which is there by default and does pretty much nothing. All right. It is a compilation error to override any method with a default access modifier. So let me be clear about that. I'm going to say in my mammal, I have public speak and it says ow wow or whatever. In my dog, I've decided that I'm going to make that private. I'm not going to allow speaking to happen. So I'm going to say I'm overriding speak and it is now private. No, can't do that. You're going to, you're going to get a compile error. It's simply just not going to accept that. If you don't want anything to happen, then you overwrite it and you return nothing. Override the parent, but don't do anything. That's the way that you make it not be public effectively. If a public method could be overwritten as a protected or private, the derived class object would not respond the same as the parent. So what that means is it is important, and you'll see why when we talk about polymorphism, that all of the same methods that are public in the parent can be called in the child. 
They may do nothing. They may be overridden to do nothing. But you have to be able to, de to call any method that's declared in any part of the hierarchy that's declared as public, you know, regardless of who you inherit it from. So if there is a method speak that is public for all mammals, then I have to be able to call speak on every dog, every cat, every cow, and every squirrel. It may do nothing, but I have to be able to call it because it's part of the definition of a mammal. And since I have inherited from mammal, I have to be able to call it. That's why this rule is there. Okay, and then the last one probably also just makes sense. A compilation error will occur if a derived classes constructor calls one of its base classes counterparts with arguments that don't match the number and type of parameters specified in one of the base class constructors. Let me phrase that slightly differently. If you try to call a constructor that doesn't exist in the base class, so in the base class, you have a constructor that takes no parameters and you have a constructor that takes one parameter. If you try to call a constructor with three parameters, you're going to get an error. But that would have been true either way. So this is just saying that if you're in a base class and you try to do that to a parent, there's no magic here. It's not like suddenly the parent will somehow have a constructor that knows what to do with those three parameters. You're going to get a compile error because it's saying you're trying to call something that you shouldn't be. All right. So we're going to talk again about the protected variables just a little bit more. And I have said earlier, if at all possible, the correct answer is you should set most of your variables to private in the base classes and also in the child classes. Um, in general, everything should be as private as it can be. Keep your private things private. All right, so a derived class object can be set, um, okay. If you were not to do this, if you set, if you make a, sorry, let me restart the sentence because I realize I just said something weird. If a parent's method or variable is set as protected, one thing that could happen is that a derived class, i.e. a child, could reach in and change it without going through the getters and setters. And that's a bad thing. You have to bear in mind that you're not always going to be the one writing the code of the child. Once you put your class out there, it's quite possible that somebody will inherit from it and start using it. You have to think through what are all the dumb things that that person is going to do. And in the case of your dog, again, I don't want them going in and randomly manipulating the, um, the hairs in the, uh, in the array of hairs. So, don't let them do that. The way you would have let them do that is by making that array of hairs protected. And you said, well, it's protected. It's good. I use the word protected. That's a good word. No, private is better. Private means they cannot mess with it. And the only way they can interact with it is with your getters and your setters, which are checking to make sure that they're not doing something completely dumb like dyeing the dog green. All right. Derived class methods would need to be written to depend on the base class data's implementation. Let me phrase that one differently. The details of exactly what that array of hairs looks like, I haven't really talked about because it's a made up example and it's kind of a crazy example. But I did mention that a given hair would have a length and it would have a color and it would have a thickness and maybe it has 12 other things. When I get a dog in the real world, I don't have to understand every detail of how the hair is made. In general, that's not something you ever want to have to think about with your dog. <laughs> you just want to have a dog that's cuddly and you play with, or a cat or a squirrel, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, so the details of the data structures, of the internal variables, and of the internal methods of a class, you should not need to understand them to use the class. And the way that that's abstracted away is by giving public setters and getters and methods that allow people to interact with the data without actually having to understand it. And the reason I say this is a couple of things. One, it's just good programming style. You should always abstract away details whenever you possibly can and never require somebody to understand how you did it. When you get on an airplane, you do not understand all of the details of how the airplane works. 
you don't understand most likely exactly what all the signals are that are going back and forth to all the actuators on the wings and the pumps for the fuel and how the pilot is where you don't care about any of that you bought a ticket and you want to get from atlanta to wherever the heck it is that you're going and as much as you want to have to deal with is to know to sit in the seat and allow the plane and the pilot to do their jobs this was back in the day when you could fly but anyway um so hiding all of that detail is important because it's good from a coding standpoint, but it also allows you to change the details without the user having to understand it. So let me go back to my plane example. When you get on the plane, a different pilot may fly the plane differently, or you may be on a different model of a plane. So the first time that you fly from Atlanta to San Francisco, maybe you're on a Boeing 777. The next time you fly, maybe you're on an Airbus A320. You don't care. Quite frankly, all you care about is that you can call the method, move me to San Francisco. The details of all of that are abstracted away from you. And that's a good thing because it allows the airline to go in and change the method, move me to San Francisco, based on their particular needs. And this might seem like an odd example, but this really does happen. You may have chose to store the dog's hair in an array and you may have thought that that was a wonderful idea. But then you may run into an, a mammal that you had never thought about that has billions of hairs, or the hairs all turn out to be different than the hairs on all of your other mammals. And you may have to change the structure that you're storing that information in to deal with this new thing that has been added. The example in the real world is you wrote a class that deals with customers. And all of a sudden they decide, the business decides, that there's a new type of customer, which is a reseller. And the reseller does things completely different than another customer. They always get discounts. They are allowed to call different methods, da 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 So either you would have to go through and change every single method that inherited and calls all of the methods in customer, or you allow everybody to continue calling their methods, but what those methods are doing under the covers, you change and it's transparent to the end users. This is what's called a contract. When you write a piece of code, you're making a contract with the people who are calling you or inheriting from you. The details of how you're doing that should be irrelevant in the contract. The only thing that's relevant is that I'm going to provide a method that returns information about the customer, or I'm going to provide you a method that moves a customer from Atlanta to San Francisco. The implementation details are not something that they should be able to see because you as the coder and owner of the base class may someday have to change it and you don't want to have to call absolutely everyone who has ever called your method and tell them they also have to change their code so again that's why you abstract things away um, you should be able to change the base class implementation while still providing the same services to the derived classes that's what i just explained and exchanging base class variables privates enables the base class implementer of these instant variables to change without affecting the derived classes implementations. Those two statements are basically saying the same thing. One is talking about derived classes and the other is not. All of that's from the same example. All right, and I believe this is our second to the last slide, so we're almost there. Thank you for sticking with me. Base classes and derived classes. When a base or superclass method is overridden in a derived class, the derived classes version often will call the parents version to do some or all of the work. All right, so I mentioned this before and you saw it in the example. The constructor for a mammal sets a bunch of things. The constructor for a dog is probably going to still need to set all of the things that the mammal would do, and then it's going to set a bunch of its own things. So this is partially why it automatically calls the constructor, but you very often will end up wanting to call a constructor that has different parameters in order to pull back in some information that's specific to you. So the point here is it is not uncommon inside of a constructor in a child class to call the constructor in the parent and pass its specific parameters to make it do whatever it is that you want. That's a very common thing. Failure to prefix the base superclass method um, name with the keyword when referring to it will cause you to call yourself. Okay. We had a method called speak, which was in mammal. And we had a method called speak, which was in dog. In mammal, it said, oh, and in dog, it said wolf. 
never thought I would be sitting in my dining room making dog noises, but here we are. Um, so if you are inside of dog and you say speak, you're going to get a wolf. If you're inside of wolf and you say speak, you're going to get a wolf, which is going to call a wolf, which is going to call wolf, and you're going to go into an infinite recursion. So you need to be careful that if what you're trying to do is call the parent, you must specify that you want the parent by saying super or base, depending on whether you're in Java or C sharp. The last comment on this slide is one that you probably will get to at some point in your life and say, I don't want to call my parent, I want to call my grandparent. So you may have an object, dog, which inherits from mammal, which inherits from animal, which inherits from living creature, I don't know, which inherits from object. So there may be many, many layers of these inheritance, and along the way you may have gained lots of attributes and abilities because all animals may be able to do something that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you may be down in dog, and you may suddenly decide that you want to call a method that is in animal, which is two layers above you, dog, mammal, animal. So you might think, oh, the answer is I just say super dot super dot whatever the method name is. No, you can't do that. Um, very specifically, neither Java nor C Sharp allows you to call a grandparent's methods directly. The only way that you can do that is if the intermediate method, in this case mammal, has either overridden or has a method that calls its parent. Why did they make this decision? Well, the answer is because you really shouldn't ever need to do that. If there is a need for you to do that, then the intermediate class should have defined how that works, and you should be calling the intermediate class, not your grandparent. So it is just a rule. You cannot call super.super .super or base.base .base or super.super.super.super. .super 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 .super. There is no such thing. The only person you can call is your direct parent. All right, we've said this before, derived classes will always call their parents. It's going to happen, uh, their parents constructor, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And if that one is derived from another class, it's going to call its parent and we're going to go all the way up the chain. All right, I do really think this is the last slide. It is. When an application creates a derived class object, the derived class constructor calls the base class constructor explicitly. I've said that many times. The base class constructor's body executes to initialize the base class instance variables that are part of the derived class object. Then the derived class constructor body executes to initialize the derived class only instance variables. So again, when you instantiate a dog, the dog's constructor is going to get called. Before that gets called, it inherently is going to call mammal's constructor. It is not uncommon that inside of dog, you're going to specifically call the mammal's constructor and then do whatever it is that you want it to actually do. Even if the constructor does not assign a value to an instance variable, the value is still initialized to its default value. Because again, if you don't have a constructor, the default is that the um, language is going to create you a blank constructor that sets everything to the default value. Ints become zero and strings become empty strings. Okay. So that was a lot of information. I know this has been one of the longer videos, but hopefully you got a lot out of it. Um, we have talked today about all the different types of inheritance um, in Java and in C Sharp. We've talked about super and base, which is how you call a parent. We've talked about how the constructors work, which hopefully that one was um, clear. Um, this summary slide is completely talking about something that has nothing to do with what I've been talking about. So ignore the summary slide. But Hopefully you guys have gotten a lot out of this today. Um, if you are lost on any of these topics or you just want to talk about them, because this is definitely one of these things that I would recommend that you go off and try to write a little example. Um, I'm going to post uh, this little example over here um, tonight for you guys. This is a C sharp implementation. And all I'm doing here is I have just another set of code so that you can see something separate from what's in the slides. This is a class definition for a person. And it has a couple of constructors, which will set their first and last names, and then a constructor that actually does set them to something useful. I'm overriding to string, and I have a couple of getters for the various different variables. So this is my person class. Then down below that, I have a customer class, which inherits from person, and then overrides some of the things that are in there and also makes calls to the parents constructors in order to actually see how that would work. 
I also have a student which inherits from person. So to be clear, I had a customer which inherits from person and a student. And in each case, they're going to have an ID which is going to say customer one or student one so that you can see some stuff. And then I have a little bit of code down at the bottom where I'm instantiating some. What I'd recommend that you do is go click on this. Again, I am going to post this next to the slide here in uh, D2L, or sorry, next to the video in D2L. Um, when you click on this link and it pops this open, there's actually a way for you to fork it. Um, and when you fork it, it is up here, I believe you press, there's a fork button right there. It'll give you your own copy of this and you can go in and start playing around with it. What I would suggest that you do is you just try calling some of the different methods a few times and seeing what happens and then try to do just a couple of examples of like, what would happen if I make a new, you can see I made a new customer and I made a new person. What happens if I make a new student, which is what's down here and what do I get for it? And does all the output make sense? And also does this warning make sense as to why I'm getting a warning up there? So I'm, it's not perfect code. It's not really doing anything useful, but it's just a shell for you to play with inheriting and pulling stuff in and seeing what it looks like and maybe overwriting a few functions. You can also put a method up at the top inside of um, person, and then you can try to call it on one of your um, students or on one of your customers in order to see what that will do. Um, just gives you a place to play. So you're welcome to do that. Certainly not required. I'll post the equivalent version in Java as well so that there's two versions out here. And again, I'll put both of those links out. And if you have any questions about any of this, then feel free to stop by office hours and I'm happy to talk through it. And everybody have a great week. Next video is going to be about polymorphism.